And next we have uh, we have James Newnorth, which uh, I understand that he on purpose tried to have the most the longest title possible. So here we go. Creating a naturally safe and inclusive work workplace and other learnings from building the world's largest space for game developers. Round of applause. Well, what if I don't deserve the applause? Shit. Uh, all right. Uh, well, yeah, uh, I went for a really long title and uh, it's a uh, it sort of represents me as well. Like I always try to uh, both think and be outside of the box. Uh, okay, bye. <laughs> uh, and uh, it can, it does many times get me into trouble. Uh, I, I rarely do things the way I probably should have done it. Uh, how many here has played The Sims? Okay, half of you or more? Okay, yeah. So, that's basically what I'm doing in real life with uh, what I'm building. Um, so I run this house, which I, in my mind, I think of it just like The Sims, where I get to place the furniture, I get to design the house, I get to bring in the people, and I get to interact with the people, and I try to like make them both as happy as possible, but also try to get them to develop and go further into their careers. And uh, I will explain more of this for those of you who don't know what I'm actually doing. <laughs> uh, but first, so I are James, uh, programmer mainly, very introvert. So uh, actually dealing with humans isn't really one of my favorite things to do, but it's uh, basically what my whole uh, life currently revolves around. Um, I like making games. I got into programming because I wanted to make games. I played these old uh, German RPGs and found myself wondering why are they not longer or bigger. And uh, from there on, I just started doing like C++ from books when I was 12 years old. And it took me a few years before I even realized what the fuck a compiler was. So I was just sitting there reading the code and learning the code without actually knowing how to compile it and run it. So, yeah, but uh, it went well. Uh, released my first MMO in uh, 2002, and then I didn't really do any more game development because I got stuck in system development and other boring stuff. And uh, somewhere along the road, I got into the game dev scene anyway. I started making friends with other people who were following their dreams of becoming game developers. And I noticed that, like, sure, there, there's the AAA scene where people are, like, I felt like they're, it felt weird because they were like, they're following their dreams, but they're also drones, just like I was working in system development, like working for a big corporation, doing my set of tasks for the day and not really being too creative about it, even though they were working on games, you know. Uh, because at bigger AAA studios, you have a very set, defined list of like, this is what you're doing, and you're not really moving beyond those borders. But the other people, the indies, ooh, uh, really inspiring people, but also troubled people. Uh, many times, well, uh, how many are indie developers here? All right. So, uh, a big issue for indie developers is usually funding, you know, like, uh, or any time you're starting your own company uh, from nothing, you're trying to make something uh, in some kind of time without having any money and, you know, you need money to survive. And when it comes to games, you can, like, if you have want to do like a proper fucking game, it can take like four years to make it, especially if you're alone. And so somehow you need to sustain yourself for these four years. And back then you didn't have early access either. So it's like, it's not like you can start selling it one year into development and so you make enough money to get by. Uh, so, and uh, these friends of mine, like, uh, and they're also like 
it feels like everybody in the indie scene is either autistic or as Asperger's. There's, there's something different with most of these people. And I think that's what makes them great as well. Like they, it, something that really makes them focus into like what they love and what they want to do and dig their heels into it. And so we're three people at that time. Uh, we all get our own apartments in uh, Malmo, uh, like two, three uh, rooms in each apartment. But all of us <laughs> use like two square meters of our house or apartment. Like we sit by the computer and then we go to sleep in the couch next to it because we can't be bothered to go to the bedroom because it's like it's too far away. And we don't use the kitchen either because like do we really have time to cook and and then we're too depressed to cook so we just like buy something uh, like cheap outside anyway like because it's cheaper to just buy like a kebab or a falafel in Malmö than actually cooking yourself so uh, so I just figured like it's such a waste of resources for us and um, and then there's a the mental aspect of it as well like we're sitting there alone every day feeling like shit because we 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 don't really feel like we couldn't go outside and be with other people because then we're wasting precious time because we need to work on the game otherwise we're not getting money and if we're not getting money we're gonna be stuck in this hellhole forever so it's kind of like ah oh, do i be happy and go meet people or do i just fucking crunch so you just spend a bunch of years crunching alone and uh that's never good. So, uh, so through my jobs, I like I, I convinced my boss. I was like, "Hey, I work for you, but can I have my friends here? Can they like sit in our office and work on games? Like, meanwhile, like, and uh, so they started doing that. So we just shared offices with whatever company I was working for. I would bring in my friends and let them work on games next to me. Like, even though I wasn't actively working on games, it still let me be a part of the." the circle of like watching gr games happen and I got to hang out with my friends they got happier because they got to like actually go outside and get some kind of distance between where they sleep and where they work so it was a good solution and I was thinking like oh, we should be able to grow this concept so uh, I started thinking about this concept more I think in 2014 I first wrote down the first like pieces of what it could be and what it should be and uh, yeah so and it, it we started officially in 2017 and it's still running and it's going pretty well um, we have had over as you can see on the screen 200 people and uh, a lot of different countries represented I think uh, I mean the, the response was overwhelming like uh, for being an introvert I, I didn't realize how big of a like network I had because um, when I first like when I first told people about the project like I've been talking to people like in person they're like everybody yeah, yeah it's cool 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 but it's like I don't know it didn't feel great but I I just made a post on my Facebook like hey I'm doing this project and by the way I didn't have any pictures of the house or anything because I just like borrowed the house in the middle of the woods to do this like a big house and I'm like hey I'm doing this project. Does anyone want to move to Sweden and do games? <laughs> and it took uh, two days, and then I was uh, fully booked for two years. Uh, and uh, the first, like, uh, sure, fully booked by that. I mean, like, we had seven bedrooms in that in that house, and uh, and all of the and I. And then I felt like, okay, I need to optimize this. So I only brought in couples. That way I could have two people per room so we could be more people <laughs> in a smaller house. So in the end, we were like 12 to 14 people in our first house. Uh, and it was like, and all these people, they paid rent in advance and signed up, bought tickets to go to Sweden. And none of them I knew from before. I've never met them before. I've never talked to them before. They all just went like, yeah, fuck it. We'll come to Sweden and do this. And it's not like, oh, they're coming from Sweden. No, no, no. They're coming from Italy, Canada, US, Germany. Like, it was crazy. I, I'm, I'm very thankful for getting that trust, especially when it's 
all they've done, like they've only they've only seen like me posting something online and someone sharing it maybe or whatever. And um, yeah, and now yeah, as you see, our longest occupancy is like two two years and nine months. And uh, I think she's currently signed up for staying until January at least. So she will be have been staying there for over three years when she's moving out. If she's moving out, because she keeps extending. So, so people don't only come for like a month or a week. They come for a long time. And uh, uh, and our like how do you say extension rate or comeback rate or whatever is about seventy or eighty percent. So seventy or eighty percent of the people who visit us extend or come back hopefully that means that i do something right uh so the point of this talk yeah um i don't know so there's a lot of different talks or talks uh opinions about what a uh, a safe place and what inclusiveness means and how we can impact the world and all that shit and I agree with very few of them. Like I agree with almost nobody, uh, <laughs> and I, I feel like I have a. To me, it's not controversial, but it feels like the people I do talk about who do care about this topic don't seem to align with my thoughts on this. So I felt like I would like to share a little bit of my thinking and how I go about making decisions and how I think about problems in order to create this type of environment. Because in the end, like as I said, 70 to 80% of the people do come back. And it's not a homogenous, uh, or I don't even know if that's the correct word, uh, group of people. It's like people of all walks of life. And we have plenty of people like who's comfortable enough to, like how do you say, come out in our place as well. So it's like, it's really like they feel accepted and they feel like they can be the one they feel like they were meant to be, that they couldn't be at home for whatever reason. Because many people come from countries where it's not accepted, either by their family or even by their government. So them being able to come to us and finally be who they want to be is important. And, and one aspect when people are talking about safe places for people and in inclusiveness isn't these people, the douchebags, the assholes, the ones with the flaws. Because uh, a, a big issue in society today, I feel like, uh, all of this, like her whole talk is all about my perspective and how I think of things. So if you don't agree, well, we can talk about it if you want to, but in the end, we're all different. And that is, I think it's super important that we, we accept everyone with their shitty worldviews and flaws. Like, sure, set up boundaries and guidelines for how you can respect each other, but in the end, let people think what they want to think. Accept them for who they are, and if you believe that your way of thinking is superior, then they're gonna come around if you let them see that side of you, or see the side of that, whatever you are representing in the end. Uh, examples of this would be like we have plenty of people coming from like Ukraine and Russia like and uh, their uh, how do you say view on gay people aren't always favorable and like so we would have like one guy coming in and it's very much like oh that's gay oh no you, you shouldn't do that and then by <laughs> like two two months into his stay I see him lying in the couch hug, like uh, how do you say spooning with another guy watching TV like, so going from the mental state where like, you can't even say something gay without him being like, ugh, and then actually being able to, I'm not saying he did it in a gay, gay way, of course, like, but he was, he felt like, oh, I can just, I can spoon with a guy and that's, that's okay. Like, it's fine. So to me, that's like the, what I want to achieve, where a person can come in with a, uh, what you would think is a skewed world reality. And they can see, okay, there is a different way. Because you don't change people by shunning them or pushing them away. You, you change them by embracing them and just letting them be themselves and see whatever you have to offer. That's my opinion. And uh, some of the ways I try to like 
get this environment to do this is of course setting the mood so in everything i do even though it might not seem like it i i try to put a lot of effort into like what i'm doing and how i'm doing it everything from like social media to like interaction in the house like so from the like how do i reach the people i want to reach to how do i deal with them once they're inside the house so when i do like social media ads and website stuff there's like small things i do to help create a more diverse selection of people and that's for example like i always like I'm not saying this is science or whatever, but I feel like it's working uh, in all my tests is that I always uh, commission a woman to make the art because I feel like if I have a woman who makes the art, it's more, it's like, how do you say, something in the art itself just speaks more to women for some reason. Like even if I would commission the same, like, hey, make this type of art from a, from a guy and a girl, I feel like somehow in the details if it's in the lines whatever it just speaks more to women for some reason and i feel like that helps push uh, uh the inclusiveness and make women more comfortable like hey this might be for me without having to go out and say hey women this is for you like so i don't actually try to make a difference between when i in my text and message on how i speak to whom it's like everybody's in welcome i the same text to both of them. I just make sure that the small details are like somehow, hopefully more attractive to the uh, one or the other without explicitly saying so. And that way I, I hope I, well, I do avoid the issue of like, but what about us? What about this? What are, Because as soon as you're targeting a group, the other groups are gonna be upset that they're not targeted. So yeah, uh, this is one of the things. And then in the interviews, because when you apply to come to us, you also have an interview first where I make sure that yeah, your expectations of what you're going to get when you come here is correct. And and uh, like try to get a general feel. Like you can generally get a feel of who people are and what their issues are like within minutes of talking to them. Maybe it's uh, like... My, my background is I come from a very troubled uh, family. Like I grew up with like uh, uh, with drug abuse, alcohol abuse from my parents, siblings, whatever. So like my whole life is built upon like I need to identify what the fuck is wrong with people as soon as possible to be ready and defend myself. So and it co comes very handy when I have to interview people uh, online because it's like it doesn't take a long time to okay this is the type of person issue you are, this is the type of issues you have. Because like issues is the one thing I have very easy to identify with people. Uh, and uh, yeah, just uh, generally go through everything. I try to like, we have a code of conduct to make sure that what we want, uh, uh, what we expect of people um, is, um, is how do you say, explained. I think it's very important that we 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 don't assume like one of the things for example uh we had an issue with uh, how many has played cards against humanity some people and uh, would you agree that it can get quite rowdy like it can get fucked up yeah and uh, and so uh, imagine having like 20 different nationalities and playing this game and some people are more fragile some people are less fragile some people think it's super fun with all the nazi jokes some people are from germany some people are jews and in this case it did not go well because <laughs> we have one person who's like like if you come from a culture that didn't actually n see any of the shit that came from world war ii it's quite fun to make all the gestures and do all the lines and etc because it's it's just a game right but it's not always a just a game for everyone but it doesn't mean that either person is right like we shouldn't do or we should do the only thing here is that the person who's initiating the game just has to set the expectations like hey we're playing cards against humanity tonight here are the rules for how i expect it to go like these are the framework for how we do it and it's very simple and it's not something i've i ever seen 
done in any of like I've been in like gaming associations for like forever and none of them ever speak about what's the boundaries of how we play today it's always like yeah now we have to change the rule for the whole organization or whatever no why not just set the rule for this gameplay whoever is organizing this gameplay can set the rules around this and if you want to play it like this or not then you don't or you play with someone else later like uh, so localized like i like to localize solutions rather than having to assert a certain way of thinking to everyone and more uh shit what's the time i have a few more slides. I have plenty of time okay good uh yeah and uh so uh, as working as a business developer i saw they had a pretty good system good system for uh how they evaluate which uh, teams to bring into the incubator and i felt like oh it's a sort of a good system and i started applying that to speculative as well as well but in the terms of like activities and what the house officially does so and like for you as a like a, if you're running a company or whatever you can think of this like for what the company does and so you have to somehow separate what does the company do officially and what does the employees do like so uh, in the house i try to make it very obvious this is house organized this is what the house is doing and this is what you're doing so because uh, the people living with us can arrange any activities and do whatever they want and i try to separate that it's like the, the church and the state it should be two separate entities uh, and so for my prioritization when i'm trying to organize events in the house like a game jam or a, a workshop or like should we go canoeing and then i try to think of uh, these points here and i always want it to be three or more so i would never do an event that's only fun because it makes no sense like uh, it had like in the end people come to us because they want to work on games and the same thing would be like an incubator or a, a job or whatever uh, so the baseline has to be like it has to be good for work or potentially it could be good for networking and fun together uh, preferably you want something that's good for work good for networking and good for fun but yeah if you only have something that's good for networking but it's boring like is it really good i don't know so that's just uh i have like a this point system and i encourage you to like see if you can write down like what's the key points for whatever business or endeavor you're doing and then just like point system it and that way organize like does it make sense or not to organize this because a lot of times uh, especially in incubators i see them sometimes they have systems like this sometimes they don't but when, even when they do they don't follow it um, is that they arrange activities and they're asking things of their the companies that they're incubating for things that doesn't make sense for their work it's like oh yeah we we have this project with the eu going on where we can make uh, an interactive media about saving the ocean and like it's not fun it's not good for networking it's not good for work because if you're putting your companies on working on a, a a small demo about how to save the ocean from plastics or whatever they're not getting their real job done right because suddenly they're spending one two months making a prototype of something nobody will ever buy maybe they will get some eu funding but usually it's the incubator that gets the eu funding they might be able to go on a conference for networking but that conference isn't for game developers so it's not actually helping them as a game development studio either and fun i guess it could be fun making it but i think they'd rather make games right so a lot of these issues like i've seen as well in like game incubators uh, yeah i like rambling uh moving on uh and then uh, i have some examples of uh various things uh the first one being a swedish term is anyone swedish here can anyone read swedish like one person yeah <laughs> you've heard of this expression yeah yeah uh 
so this expression is sort of what I, what speculative is built around as well. Uh, Lika bon leka best, like uh, similar, like like-minded children plays the best. So the fact that our house is filled with game developers, or specifically people who have a burning passion for game development, sort of removes all the other issues around it, because we're all there for the same reason. And usually because of that one thing that unites us, a lot of the other side hobbies also do. Like it's, it's a, like because of this, it's easier to find people to play D&D &D with. People usually play Magic the Gathering together. We have like a whole clan of World of Warcrafters right now and all that stuff. Like, because in the end, like we're very similar people like, in interests like if one if you have one then you usually have more so uh, that's one of the things so uh, yeah um, this one uh, super important uh, like democracy is nice but it sucks uh, <laughs> e no matter what's happening if there's an activity or whatever always make sure someone is responsible like you see this in a lot of uh, companies and et cetera. It's just like, so, like, okay, we're doing this, like we're doing this, but always put someone in charge of everything. Someone has to be responsible and accountable. Someone has to make sure that the, the cans are put back where they should be and uh, everything has cl is cleaned up afterwards. And if, if you share the responsibility, then nobody takes responsibility. That's one of my opinions. Um, when you, like, whether you have a, a company or incubator, a small community, game jam, whatever, people like to have a meaningful life and be a part of something. Like, people want to help. So, and with this, I mean, for my sake, for example, I don't necessarily want to ask people to help. I, I try to make sure that I don't ask people, hey, could you do all these things, et cetera, et cetera. But I, I give people opportunity to step up. And uh, I think that's a really good thing to try to think about in your, if, that you leave openings and possibilities for people to take responsibility and step up. And just leave certain things open for them. Uh, yeah, I should have more specific uh, examples, but yeah. Uh, yes, so this one became especially big during the COVID period because it was, uh, so imagine you have like 40, 50 people uh, living in a house and COVID hits, <laughs> which means like suddenly borders are closing, people are dying everywhere and we're gathered like 40, 50 people in the dining hall trying to discuss, okay, what do we do? Like, because suddenly people can't go home people like and like some people are like okay my country is offering me a plane ride home now if i don't take it i will be stuck here for two years what's what's the decision what are we gonna do like how does it work and a lot of this yeah and yeah, just imagine like in real life, you have the vaxxers, you have the anti-vaxxers, you have the people who believe in COVID, you have the people who don't believe in COVID. And it was all quite a blur in the first time you heard about COVID because we were like, we, we brought this up very early. As soon as we heard COVID was a thing, like in like January, February of 2019, we brought it up to like discuss it. What are we doing? What's the, like, how do we plan for this? And so we had like, <laughs> a lot of like um, democratic I let it be democratic because in like and that's the thing here like typically I make sure to let everyone know it's a dictatorship like I make the decisions I decide uh, in this case because everything was uncertain I didn't feel like I should be deciding I don't know I'm not a doctor I don't know anything and in the end what's most important is that people feel safe because the worst thing you can do is have people panic. And people did panic. Uh, like, we, we even had to resort to doing something which I hate, which is like banning words. I don't believe words inherently are bad. I think the way we use them are bad. But 
like in these times we had such pe people who would just like they start shivering just as if you said COVID. So I, like in that times we like okay a majority of the people wants to ban the word COVID. So we're just like the one who shall not be named. <laughs> like so, so everybody just start, started talking about Voldemort basically. <laughs> like <laughs> and we put in a lot of different rules and and then one day it happened one person got COVID. But we already had a system in place to make sure that it didn't spread, we felt like, but we were pretty loosey-goosey about it because it's like, eh, it's been like almost a year now, nothing has happened. We've been playing it safe. We've been avoiding being outdoors too much, like, or like we've been trying to keep in our bubble, right? To make sure that we can move around freely in the house without endangering an anyone. Because we have people with autoimmune uh, disease and all that stuff that like, yeah, they would be fucked if they got it. And so one person who has been away with their family comes back, has it. And uh, sure, they've been wearing masks and stuff like that inside. And we were thinking like, oh, shit, so everybody's quarantined in their rooms. So like, two weeks, everybody's locked in their rooms. And at this time, we don't have like tests. Like we can't get tests home. We have to go to the doctor to get tested. So it's just everybody locked in for two weeks and very little of this like a lot of people were upset about it not coming officially from the house that this is the way we're doing it and this is how because in the end like i felt like there was no win condition here either if we go too hard people are going to be angry if we go too loose people are going to be angry so i just let it up to the people to decide together like how are we solving this and everybody helped each other doing what's best in this situation and and i think that's a, that's okay like sure I had to take the the hit from some people about you're not doing enough like but it's okay like be let them shit on you like and give them the room to make decisions as well and like take a personal responsibility uh so yeah don't always feel like you have to make an estate a statement about things that's how i feel uh, happiness is relative and people forget. It doesn't matter how much sh shit you do. People are going to be happy, but in like a month, that's the new normal. So if you, if you get something that's like, this is great, it's great for like a very short time. And then it's like, they need more and more and more and more. So don't, don't worry too much if people are just okay. Like it's, it's okay as well. Like you don't always have to keep them happy. They have to find other things to make them happy as well. Um, <laughs> avoid being a cult. <laughs> this is my uh, final one. Uh, so, a big issue with what we have is that it's very easy to be. Well, you didn't do the one. Ah, I didn't see it. Oh, anyway, avoid being a cult. It's good. Uh, good thing for everyone. Question. <laughs> you can ask me about cults. <laughs> One question. So, uh, how many relationships came out of this? <laughs> relationships? Uh, I think we, we talked about this like a week ago, I think. Uh, I think it was around four. I, I mean, it's like, I, like, this is also one of the things where I'm like, oh, should we or should we not? I would love to have a rule that says, you're not allowed to date anyone in the house, not specifically because I don't want people to date, but because I want people to feel like this is a place you can go for work and not have to worry about getting picked up. Because uh, I, I, I hate the fact that in today's society, a, a woman can't work at a place without getting hit on. It, it fucking sucks, and I see it all the time that as soon as we have a pretty girl, especially single, there are some people who rarely come out of their office or their room that suddenly hangs around in like the public areas way more than they should. And they're only r hanging around when specific persons, a uh, person are around. And I hate it, but it's also like, what am I supposed to do? Like, hey, you don't get to like somebody, ah, like, but I, I do try to make sure, like, from my side of things, I try to, like, as much as I can, just uh, deter it. Like, say, that's shitty behavior. 
and then like hope people hear it. <laughs> I guess, yeah. And we've only always also set up like make sure that we have like a contact person for for um, uh, for women. That so if they do feel like they are not able to focus on work, etc., because they are being like I don't know, just like talk to too much about pe from people that's like all that shit like just make sure that we have a contact person that they can uh, contact anonymously or directly so to avoid it like we haven't had issues with it so far like to the point where someone felt uncomfortable but yeah i i it's inevitable i think it's gonna happen and i want to try to make it not happen for as long as possible so yeah okay thank you and here is your rigor balsam <laughs>